Hello. In today's lesson, both Candace and Anne are going to be working application problems that involve percents. Candace is going to be talking about simple interest problems. Anne's going to be talking about what we call mixture problems. Both of these concepts are founded in percents. So I'm going to begin today's lesson by reviewing percents and talking about different ways that we work with percents. So I'm going to begin by reviewing the relationship between percents, fractions, and decimals. Then I'm going to talk about a basic blueprint that we can use for basic percent questions. And then I'm going to finish up with a bona fide application involving percents. So let's begin by reviewing the relationship between percents, fractions, and decimals. And specifically, let's begin with a question. What do we mean when we say 17%? Well, the key to answering this question is to focus on the cent. Think about words that have cent in them. Century. Century is 100 years. There's 100 cents in a dollar. When we say 17%, we mean 17 per 100. Another way of thinking about this is 17 out of 100. So when we represent 17% as a fraction, we represent it as the fraction 17 over 100, 17 parts out of 100. Now when we take that 17 in the numerator and divide by 100, the net result on the 17 is that the decimal point, rather than falling after the 7, gets moved two places to the left. So 17% which equals 17 out of 100, 17 one hundredths, also equals 0.17. Now let's focus for a moment just on the relationship between the percent and the decimal. We start with 17%, and I'm going to do a little cloning and make another 17%. Now, for the time being, I'm going to take that percent symbol and I'm going to change it to a decimal point. And I can see above that the decimal equivalent of 17% is created by moving the decimal point after the 7 two places to the left. So when I take 17% and I want to create the decimal equivalent, I want to imagine there being a decimal point after the 7, and I want to move that decimal point one, two places to the left. And when I do that, I have established that 17% is equal to 0.17. Now suppose I had started with the decimal. Well, what's the reverse of moving the decimal point two places left? It's moving the decimal point two places right. So focus on that decimal point between the 0 and the 1. If I move it right two places, I end up with 17. 0.17 is equal to 17%. So let's work a couple of examples uh, cementing these ideas. What is a fractional equivalent of 52.7%? What is the decimal equivalent of 52.7%? So let's begin with the fractional equivalent. 52.7% is equal to 52.7 parts out of 100. But right now, we have what I would call a pretty stinky fraction, because we are mixing decimals and fractions. And it's really not good proper math form to mix decimals and fractions. So what I really want to do here is I want to eliminate that decimal expression in the numerator. I can do that if I move the decimal point one place to the right. And mathematically, the way that I can affect a decimal shift one place to the right is I can multiply by 10. But if I multiply by 10, I don't have the same number I start, started with. But if I multiply by 1, I will have the same number that I started with. So I'm also going to multiply the denominator by 10. So a legitimate fractional equivalent of 
of 52.7% is when I perform these multiplications, I'm left with the fraction 527 over 1,000. Also, the other half of the question was, what is the decimal equivalent of 52.7%? Well, let's start with 52.7%, and let's remember the little trick that we explored on the last screen. When we're moving from percent to decimal, one way that we can come up with the equivalent number is we can take the decimal point in the percent expression and we can move it to the left two digits. So 52.7% is equal to the decimal 0 0.527. Now if I was presenting my work, I wouldn't really want to have my little arrow action going on there, so I'm going to go ahead and erase that as if I was going to turn in this paper. Let's also notice that the fraction, or at least a fractional equivalent of 52.7 percent was 527 over 1,000. The net effect of dividing 527 by 1,000 is that we take the decimal point, which is a currently occurring after the 7, and we need to move it left three places. And if we took a decimal point that was after the 7, and we move that decimal point left one, two, three places, yes indeedy, we end up with 0.527. Let's look at another question. What is the reduced fractional equivalent of 1.25? What is the percentage equivalent of 1.25? Let's begin with the fraction. 1.25 we could create by taking 125 and dividing by 100. Both 125 and 100 are evenly divisible by 25. 125 is 25 times 5. 100 is 25 times 4. When I factor out 25 over 25, I'm left with 5 fourths. What is the percent equivalent of 1.25? Well, using my trick, to go from decimal to percent, I need to shift the decimal point two places right. So 1.25 is equivalent to 125%. Notice that in my fractional equivalent, I had 125 over 100. 125 per 100. 125 per cent. All right. Now let's talk about a basic blueprint for solving basic percent questions. Again, let's begin with a question. What do we mean when we say 25 percent? Well, we've already discussed that. We can think of 25 percent as 25 per hundred. But in this example, I'm going to think of it a little bit differently. It might be a little easier to think of 25 percent as 25 out of every 100. So let's ask the specific question. What is 25 percent of 300? Well, let's get back to the cent, to the hundred. If we have 100 objects, 25% represents 25 out of these 100 objects. So let's extend our set so that we have 300 objects. I want three copies of this diagram. When I create three copies of the 100 objects of which 25 have whatever property we're talking about, I end up with 300 objects, and I can see that 75 have whatever property I'm talking about. So it looks like 75 is 25 percent of 300. Now let's make a little arithmetic observation. We could have come up with 75 by taking the fractional representation of 25 percent and multiplying by 300. If I think about 25 over 100 times 300, dividing 300 by 100 is 3, and 3 times 25 is 75. Let's look at another example. What is 30 percent of 60? Well, again, let's begin by considering 100 objects, 30 out of which have a certain property. What I want to do is I want to know how does this translate if my set only had 60 objects. I can begin to consider this by taking my 100 objects and dividing it into five equal groups. But when I take my 100 objects and divide it into five equal groups, I also need to parse the 30 
objects that have some common property into five equal groups. So here what I have is I've taken my 100 objects, I've broken it up into five groups of 20 objects, and in each one of these groups of 20 objects, six of the objects have some common principle. So in order for me to consider a set with 60 objects, I just want three of these rectangles, each containing 20 objects. And when I look at three of the rectangles, each containing 20 objects, check it out. 18 of the objects have whatever common property is defining the 30%. So it looks to me like 18 is 30% of 60. So we saw an example where 75 is 25% of 100, and that ended up translating into the equation 75 equals 25 over 100 times 300. Now we just saw an example showing that 18 is 30% of 60. Let's see if we get a similar equation. Do we get 18 equals 30 over 100 times 60? Well, let's consider this. If we multiply 30 and 60, we get 1,800. 1,800 divided by 100 is indeed 18. So it looks to me like we have a basic blueprint for basic percent questions. Our blueprint is this. When we say A is B percent of C, that's equivalent to the equation A equals B over 100 times C. This is our basic blueprint. Let's put it into action with some examples. There are 32 students in one section of Math 60. Exactly 37.5% of the students in the class own graphing calculators. How many students in the class own graphing calculators? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to fit this to our verbal model, A is B percent of C. We need to figure out which two of these letters we know the value of and which letter we're trying to figure out the value for. Well, we definitely know the percent, right? 37.5 percent. We also know the total number of students in the class. That's the C. So the question we're being asked is, what is 37.5 percent of 32. So in this example, the unknown is A. So let's go ahead and define our unknown. Let's let A represent the number of students um, in this class who own graphing calculators. Now we already discussed our general model is A is B percent of C and applied to this problem we're trying to solve A is 37.5 percent of 32. Using our model equation this is equivalent to the equation A equals 37.5 over 100, that's the fractional representation of 35 percent, multiplied by the total number of students, which is 32. Now before I actually write down my own equation, I'm going to take that 37.5 over 100 and I'm going to change it to its decimal equivalent. 37.5 over 100 is equivalent to the decimal 0.375. The decimal 0.375 is equivalent to 37.5 percent. So my equation that I'm going to use is that A equals 0 0.375 times 32. Now this looks like some pretty tricky arithmetic to me and luckily we live in the age of technology that's going to allow me to use this little calculating device to uh, do the tricky arithmetic for me. So I want to go ahead and clear my screen and let's take 0.375 and let's multiply that by 32. Voila! 12. A is 12. But we weren't asked to find the value of A, we were asked to find the number of students who own graphing calculators. So we need to make sure that we write a um, conclusion that answers the question we were actually asked. So um, a good conclusion here would be that the number of students
in this section of Math 60 who are on graphing calculators is 12. Now, if you took that sentence and you ran it by your writing instructor, you might get the big thumbs down. But this is math class. It's complete. It tells us the correct number, so we give it the big thumbs up. Let's see another example. The chemical formula for TNT is C7H5N3O6. What percentage of atoms in TNT are nitrogen atoms? Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, what the heck are you talking about? Well, so I think the first thing we better figure out is what is all this funny notation, C7H5N3O6? That is a chemical representation for a molecule of TNT. The letters all represent different types of atoms, and the numbers represent how many of each type of atom are in a molecule of TNT. Specifically, each molecule of TNT contains seven carbon atoms, the C represents carbon, five hydrogen atoms, H for hydrogen, three nitrogen atoms, N for nitrogen, and six oxygen atoms, O for oxygen. If we tally up here, let's see, seven plus five plus three plus six, that's 21. So each TNT molecule has 21 total atoms, and three of these atoms are nitrogen atoms. So our basic blueprint is A is B percent of C. We know A, there's three nitrogen atoms. We know C, there's 21 atoms total. We're asking the question, three is what percent of 21? The unknown is B. So let's go ahead and define our unknown. Let's let B represent the percentage of atoms that are nitrogen atoms. Now we have our basic blueprint, and our basic blueprint applied to this problem is that we're asking 3 is B percent of 21. So that translates into the equation 3 equals b over 100 times 21. So let's go ahead and write that equation. 3 equals b over 100 times 21. This time I have a little bit of work to isolate my variable. I can isolate my variable if I first observe that b over 100 times 21 is the same as 21 over 100 times b, and then I observe that to isolate b, I need to multiply by the reciprocal of 21 over 100, which is 100 over 21. But of course, whatever I do to the left side of the equation, I need to do to the, um, excuse me, whatever I do to the right side of the equation, I need to take the same action on the left side of the equation. So this gives me, using a little bit of symmetric property of equality, the equivalent equation that b equals 100 over 21 times 3. So let's go ahead and get out the calculator and see what it tells us for 100 over 21 times 3. So I'm first going to clear out my calculator, and then I'm going to take 100, divide, 21 and then multiply by 3 and the result is this pretty run-on digity kind of number. I don't really think that I need to know the percentage to this amount of accuracy. So I think rather than writing down 14.285714, I'm just going to approximate this to 14.3. So I'm going to say this is about 14.3. But remember, the question wasn't what is B? The question was, what is the percentage of nitrogen atoms? So I need to write a conclusion that actually addresses the question. The percentage of atoms 
in a TNT molecule that are nitrogen atoms is about, I'm using the word about because I approximated, it's about 14.3 percent. Now this sentence, again, from your writing instructor might get that, but it's math class. It's a thumbs up. We clearly identified what we found and we used our unit and its value. Here's another question. To celebrate National Poultry Day, the owner of Uncle Jeb's Chicken Hut decide to reduce all of their prices by 20 percent. With the price reduction, the cost of Jeb's wing-a-ding-ding -ding platter is six dollars. What is the non-discounted price of the platter? If you're wondering if this is the bona fide example I promised, no, we haven't gotten to that one yet. Before I do this problem correctly, I'm going to address a very, very common error people make with questions like this. What the problem is saying is we took a, a price, we reduced it by 20 percent, and we ended up with a price of six dollars. The way a lot of people like to attempt to solve this problem is they like to take the sale price and add 20 percent of the sales price to figure out the original price. Well, there's a flaw with this. If we take this equation right here and we subtract the 20 percent of six dollars from both sides of the equation, look what we end up with. We end up with the equation that six dollars equals seven dollars and twenty cents, which is our supposed original price, minus twenty percent of six dollars. Can you see the flaw? The flaw is we're not reducing the price by twenty percent of the original price, we're reducing the price by twenty percent of the new price. It doesn't work that way. If seven dollars and twenty cents was the original price, the new price would be seven dollars and twenty cents minus twenty percent of seven dollars and twenty cents. And since seven point two minus point two times six equals six, one thing's for sure. Seven point two minus point two times seven point two doesn't equal six. This method isn't working. So let's think about a method that might work. And in order to fit our model, A equals B percent of C, we need to think about the fact that six is what percent of our original price? Well, if we reduced our original price by 20 percent, we must have retained 80 percent of our original price. So to fit the model A is B percent of C, we need to ask this question. Six is 80 percent of what? Remember, if we discount the price by 20 percent, we retain 80 percent of the original price. So in this example, the unknown is C. So let's go ahead and let's define or let C represent the original price. Here's our basic blueprint applied to this problem. The question is 6 is 80 percent of C, which translates into the equation 6 equals 80 over 100 times C. The decimal equivalent of 80 over 100 is 0.8. So I'm going to go ahead and write down the equation 6 equals 0.8 times C. To isolate C, all I need to do is divide both sides of the equation by 0.8 using the symmetric property of equality, I get the equivalent equation C equals whatever 6 divided by 0.8 is. And I've got a calculator to answer that question. 6 divided by 0.8 is 7.5. And checking my work here, I did come up with the correct final value. But if I was grading my own work, I'd take off half a, pay, half a point because I forgot to indicate that on the right, I'm not dividing by C, 
I'm actually dividing by 0.8. But look at how easy it was to fix that c into a 0.8. Now, this problem was quite a bit more complex than the first couple of examples I worked. So before I state my conclusion, I think I'm going to make sure that this answer makes sense in the context of the problem. So if the original price were $7.50, the discounted price would be, well, we'd have our $7.50, and we'd be reducing that by 20% of $7.50. Looks like it's calculator time again. So we've got 7.5. We're subtracting 0.2 times 7.5. Hopefully, when we hit the equal button, we get 6. Yeah, who we do. So our answer checks. This does equal $6. So we can go ahead and state our conclusion. So the original price of Uncle Jeb's wing uh, ding ding platter was $7.50. You know, I probably could have just said the original price was $7.50, but then I wouldn't have gotten to say wing a ding ding again. Speaking of fun things to say, it's time for our bona fide application involving percents. In 2002, the Oregon State Personal Income Tax allowed a tax write-off to many families who had their children in daycare. The percentage of daycare costs that could be deducted from the total tax owed depended upon the size of the family and the total income of the family. Table 4 shows the percentage of child care costs that could be written off by a family of four depending upon the family's total income. I do want to tell you that this table came directly from the directions of the 2002 Oregon State Income Tax Form. Let's figure out how much of a total of $3,000 in child care costs could have been deducted by an Oregon family of four that had a total income of $40,000 in 2002. Now this table might be a little difficult for you to read on your TV, so I'm going to remember the fact that our Oregon family earned a total income of $40,000, and I'm going to blow up the table to make it a little easier to read. So looking at the left column here, there's actually two columns in the left column. There's an at least column and a but less than column, and all of the figures here are referencing dollar amounts. So I need to figure out where does 40000 fit into this table. Well, if I look down here, I can see that $40,000 falls in the row that talks about the income being at least $39,800 and less than $41,650. Now, the heading on the second column is enter this decimal amount on line 6. Well, out of context, this direction doesn't make a lot of sense. But like I said, this table truly came from the tax directions. That's why it's got that. What we want to focus on is the 0.24. The 0.24 is the decimal representation of 24%. So what this is telling us is that this particular family could have written off 24% of their child care costs. They truly could have taken off of their tax bill 24% of their child care costs. So back to our question. How much of a total of $3,000 in child care costs could have been deducted by an Oregon family of four that had a total income of $40,000 in 2002? Our motto is A is B percent of C. We want to figure out what is 24% of 3,000. The unknown is A. So let's let A 
represent the total amount of child care costs the family could have deducted. Here's our generic model, and when we quickly change that to how it's applied specifically to this problem, we have A is 24% of 3,000. That's equivalent to the equation A equals 24 over 100 times 3,000. Before I actually write down the equation, I'm going to observe that 24 over 100 is equivalent to the decimal 0.24. So the equation I'm going to write down is A equals 0.24 times 3,000, it wouldn't have been wrong to write down A equals 24 over 100 times 3,000. I'm just saving myself a couple of punches on my calculator. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and clear our calculator and let's take 0.24 and let's multiply by 3,000, 720. So writing a nice, clear conclusion, the family could have deducted $720 in child care costs from their 2002 Oregon State Income Tax Bill. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that $720 is a pretty good chunk of change. So here is a bona fide example showing that percents in a lot of situations, they're your friend. And speaking of friends, Candace is your friend too. And she's about to come show you some examples involving percents in the context of simple interest. In this part of the lesson, I'm going to talk about simple interest problems. I'm going to start by looking at the simple interest formula and look at some application problems involving simple interest. So let's start with the simple interest formula. The simple interest formula, I equals PRT, gives the interest in dollars earned by an account in which P dollars are inv invested at a rate R for T years. The interest rate is applied only to the original principal P in computing the amount of interest. This is as opposed to compound interest. The interest rate is written in decimal form. So if we have something like an interest rate of 7% per year, we're going to change that to decimal form and write that as 0 0.07. Let's say Kieran invested money in an account that pays 5% simple interest per year for two years. If he earned $80 in interest, how much did he invest? So our question here is, how much did he invest? We want to know what the principal was. So I'm going to define my variable, P, and let it represent the amount of money, which I'm going to measure in dollars, that Kieran invested. Well, thinking about my simple interest formula, I'm given that the interest he earned was $80. So I know that I equals 80. I'm given that the account pays 5% simple interest per year. So I can write R in decimal form as 0 0.05. And I know that the investment was invested for two years. So I know T is 2. So in my simple interest formula, I equals P R T, my only unknown is P. I'll substitute the other values. 80 equals P times 0 0.05 times 2. 
Simplifying the right-hand side, I have 80 equals 0 0.10 p. To isolate p, I would have to divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.1. Let's fix that. And if I divide 80 by 0.1, essentially all I need to do is move the decimal to the decimal one spot to the right. So 80 becomes 800 when I divide it by 0.1. So 800 equals p. So I can say the amount Kieran invested. was $800. Well, now I want to look at a couple of application problems involving simple interest. First, let's say Joan invests in an account that earns 7% simple interest per year. She invests three times as much in an account that earns 10% simple interest per year. If the total interest from the investments is $740 after one year, how much did she invest in each account? Now, if you're thinking, why did Joan invest anything in a 7% account when she has this other 10% account, you might think about high-risk and low-risk type accounts. And uh, let's assume for this problem that the 10% simple interest is a high-risk account. And for simplicity in this problem, we're going to assume that that 10% ended up being a fixed rate over this one-year period. Before I start doing anything, I want to review the problem solving steps. First, we want to understand the problem. Second, clearly define a variable to represent the unknown quantity. If there's more than one unknown quantity, find expressions using your defined variable that represent each of the other unknowns in the problem. Write an equation to model the problem. Solve the equation and check the solution. Remember to check it in the context of the problem. And state a conclusion to the problem. So I want to start with this understanding the problem. I know that some of Joan's money was invested at 7%, and three times as much was invested at 10%. Her total interest was $740 for the one-year period. What I want to know is how much she invested in each account. Some people find it helpful to organize the information in a table. So what I've done with this table is labeled the first row with the quantities from the simple interest formula. Principal times rate times time equals interest. Well, I know the rate, so I'm going to go ahead and fill those in. There's a 7% interest rate in decimal form, that's 0 0.07. There's a 10% interest rate in decimal form, that's 0 0.10. And I know we're talking about a one-year time period, so I'm going to put 1 in for the time on both of these. The unknown happens to be the principal in each of these accounts. I'm being asked how much did she invest at each rate. So let's say she invested P dollars in the 7% account. Well, then how much did she invest in the account earning 10% per year? Well, we're told three times as much was invested in the account earning 10% simple interest per year. So we need three times P, which we can write as 3P. To fill in my interest column, now I'm going to use the simple interest formula. Interest equals principal times rate times time. So for the 7% account, the interest would be P times 0 0.07 times 1. For the 10% interest account, that's going to be 3P times 0 0.1 times 1. Sometimes in helping to understand the problem, it helps to write a verbal model, and that often leads us into an equation. So I want to write a verbal model here. I know that Joan's investing in two different accounts. So if I look at the interest she earns from the 7% account and add that to the interest she earns from the 10% account, I should come up with a total for her total interest, and we know that that's $740. So I'm going to start by writing a verbal model. So I'm going to start with Joan's interest from the account earning 7%. 
To that, I'm going to add Joan's interest. from the account. Earning 10%. Now if I add these two amounts of interest together, I'll get Joan's total interest. So now I have a verbal model to work with. Before doing anything else, though, I want to make sure I clearly define a variable. I did write variables in the table, but I've never defined them. And I had a variable and another quantity in terms of that variable. That's because there were two unknowns in the problem. When we have two unknowns, we need to make sure that we find an expression using our defined variable that represents the other unknown. So in my table, I had picked the variable p. So I'm going to define the variable p. I'm going to say let p represent the amount of money and this is going to be measured in dollars Joan invested at 7%. From my table, I can already see what my other expression was. Three times as much was invested at 10%. So 3p is going to represent the amount of money Joan invested at 10%. So we can say then 3p represents the amount of money and of course I'll be measuring this in dollars also. Joan invested at 10%. So now I want to write an equation to model the problem. To help me do that, I'm going to go back to my verbal model, which was Joan's interest from the account earning 7% plus Joan's interest from the account earning 10% equals Joan's total interest. And I actually have Joan's interest from the account earning 7% in my table. I also have Joan's interest from the account earning 10% in the table. That was what I got when I computed principal times rate times time to find the interest. So Joan's interest from the account earning 7% is P times 0 0.07 times 1. And Joan's interest from the account earning 10%, the bottom part of my table here, is 3P times 0.1 times 1. And all of this should equal Joan's total interest, which we were told was $740. So let's solve this equation. So I have P times 0 0.07 times 1 plus 3P times 0 0.1 times 1 equals 740. Now I want to simplify the left-hand side of this equation a little bit. The first term's easy. Well, I can just write that as 0 0.07 times p. Then I need to distribute, then I need to, excuse me, just multiply 3p by 0.1 and by 1. That's also easy. 3 times 0.1 is 0.3. So I have 0.3p as my second term. And all of this equals 740. Now if I combine my like terms, I need to add the coefficients 0 0.07 and 0.3. When I add those together, I have 0.37. So I have 0.37p equals 740. Now to solve for p, I need to divide both sides of this equation by 0.37. And I'm going to pull out my calculator to figure out what 740 divided by 0.37 is. So 740 divided by 0.37 equals 2,000. So I have P equals 2,000. Let's go ahead and check the solution in the context of the problem. 
So what I have here is that Jones investing $2,000 in the account paying 7% simple interest per year. So let's figure out the interest from that. That's going to be 2,000 times 0 0.07 times one, because it was one year. And we're told she invests three times as much in an account that earns 10% simple interest. Three times 2,000 is 6,000. So 6,000 at 10%, 0.1, for one year. Hopefully this adds up to $740, her total interest. Well, let's pull out the calculator and check. So we have 2,000 times 0 0.07, the 7% interest, times one year, plus 6,000 times 0 0.1, that was the 10% interest, that's also for one year, and that equals 740. This is good. We were told that Joan's total interest for the year was $740. So this checks. So now I need to state a conclusion to the problem. So I can say Joan invested $2,000 at 7% and $6,000 at 10%. Let's look at another example. Elijah invested $5,000. He put some into an account earning 5.5% simple interest per year, and the rest in an account earning 7% simple interest per year. If his income from interest during the year was $335, how much did he invest in each account? Well, first of all, I'm thinking this sounds a lot like the Joan problem. I have an amount of money that wasn't given in the own problem, but it's being invested in two accounts, same thing Joan did. This time we've got an account earning 5.5% simple interest per year and another account earning 7% simple interest per year. So I don't think I'm going to go through setting up the table as I did in the Joan problem. I'm going to say, okay, I have a pretty good understanding of the problem and I'm going to jump into clearly defining my variable. Well, my question is, how much did he invest in each account? So I'm going to pick my variable to represent the amount that he invested in the 5.5% simple interest account. So I'm going to let P represent the amount of money which I'm going to measure in dollars that Elijah invested at 5.5%. Then I'm told the rest of his money was put in an account earning 7% simple interest per year. Well, the rest of his money, I have to go back and say the rest of what money? $5,000. Elijah invested $5,000. So if he took P dollars out of that, and invested it in the 5%, 5.5% account, then he's got 5,000 minus P left to invest in the account earning 7% simple interest per year. So 5,000 minus P then will represent the amount Elijah invested at 7%. And again, I'll measure this amount of money in dollars. So now I want to think about the problem again. Elijah invested $5,000. We know that he put some in two different accounts, the same thing he did with the Joan problem. So I'm going to think about my verbal model for the Joan problem. That was Joan's interest from the account earning 7% plus her interest from the account earning 10% was equal to Joan's total interest. Well, let's put this in the context of the Elijah problem. Elijah's interest from the account earning 5.5% plus Elijah's interest from the account earning 7% is going to equal Elijah's total interest. Now we need to remember our simple interest formula. 
interest equals principal times rate times time. So to figure out Elijah's interest from the account earning 5.5%, I have to start with his principal. That was the variable I defined as P times his interest rate, which written in decimal form is 0 0.055 times the time, which is one year. Similarly, for Elijah's interest from the account earning 7%, we said the amount that he invested was 5,000 minus P at 7%, so times 0 0.07 for one year. And this should equal Elijah's total interest. We were told his total interest was $335. So let's solve this equation that we just came up with. So I have P times 0 0.055 times 1 plus the quantity 5,000 minus P times 0 0.07 times 1. And all of this equals 335. Now let me simplify the left-hand side. My first term is just 0 0.055 P. In my second term, I have the quantity 5,000 minus P multiplied by 0 0.07 multiplied by 1. If I multiply 0 0.07 by 1, I still have 0 0.07. But I need to distribute the 0 0.07 to the 5,000 and to the minus P. The second term's easy. I'm just going to have minus 0.07p. But I'm going to pull out a calculator to figure out what 5,000 times 0.07 is. So I want 5,000 times 0.07. And I get 350. So distributing, I have 350 minus 0.07p. And all of this equals 335. Now, if I combine my like terms, I have 0.055p minus 0.07p. That gives me negative 0.015p plus 350 equals 335. Checking my calculation here, 0 0.055 minus 0 0.07 is actually 0 0.015. I left off a 0. So let me fix that. So I want to isolate P, so I'm going to subtract 350 from both sides of this equation. So minus 0 0.015P plus 350 minus 350 equals 335 minus 350. Simplifying, I have negative 0.015p equals negative 15. To solve for p, I need to divide both sides of the equation by negative 15 by negative 0 0.015, I know my result's going to be positive. And if I think about moving the decimal place in the denominator over three places to the right, I'd need to do the same thing in the numerator. So I could divide 15,000 by 15. And that result is 1,000. So I come up with my equivalent equation, p equals 1,000. Well, now I need to check my solution in the context of the problem. So that P equals 1,000 that I just came up with represents the amount of money that Elijah invested in the account earning 5.5% simple interest. So to figure out his interest from the account earning 5.5%, I have to take 1,000, multiply it by 0 0.055 times 1, because it was one year. And then the rest of his money was in an account earning 7%. Well, he invested $5,000 altogether, so that leaves $4,000 in the account earning 7%. So to find the interest, 4,000 times 0 0.07 times the one year. Again, I'm going to pull out a calculator to do this calculation. 
So I need to take 1,000 times 0 0.055 plus 4,000 times 0 0.07, and hopefully I'm going to get $335 as total interest. And that works. So this checks in the context of the original problem. Now I can go ahead and state a conclusion to the problem. So what I found is that Elijah invested $1,000 at 5.5% and $4,000 at 7%. Now I'm going to turn this over to Anne, who's going to talk about some mixture problems also involving percents.